Hi guys, today we're going to be talking all about orbits. So this follows on from the previous work that we've been doing on gravitational fields and now we're going to apply them to things going around in a circle. So here's a scenario for you to think about. I want you to imagine that I launch a rocket vertically upwards to a height of 400 kilometers above the Earth's surface. So let's say I start from about here and I launch up to there. So that gives me uh, a distance of 400 meters from the surface, sorry 400 kilometers from the surface. I want to know what will happen next. So uh, I'll tell you what, if you're watching this on Edpuzzle, uh, I'll give you one second to think of the answer. Okay, if you're watching an puzzle, um, we'll see what you would have found out. Um, but let's think about the rocket as it sits here at its 400 kilometres above the Earth. Um, will there be any forces on it? Well, we now know the equations we want, and we can say with pretty much, with, with some certainty, I would hope, you can say, yes, there will be a force due to gravity. And can we work out what that force due to gravity will be? Well, yeah, we can, because we can say, uh, well, we don't you know, sorry, we can't work out what the force is, because the force is F is G M1 M2 over R squared. And we don't know uh, what the uh, mass of the rocket is here. That would be M2. M1, obviously, would be the mass of the Earth. However, just because we don't know the mass of the rocket, we can still say, well, there's going to be a force acting on my rocket, which means there's going to be an acceleration. Um, and I can say that the acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. Therefore, I can say the acceleration of my rocket is equal to g mass of the Earth divided by the square of my distance from the centre of the Earth. So straight away you can see there is going to be an acceleration of my rocket, um, and I can go ahead and calculate what that will be. Um, remember, I need to use r here, not uh, distance, not just distance. So if I go from there, I need to find r. So r will equal the radius of the Earth plus. 400 kilometers and because I always do it in meters we'll say 400 times 10 to the 3 so that will be uh, the radius of the earth so that will be 6 uh, 3 7 1 times 10 to the 3 plus 400 times 10 to the 3 so to go ahead and find my acceleration I'll just plug those numbers in and I can say the acceleration of my rocket is equal to 6.674 times 10 to the negative 11 multiplied by the mass of the earth which is 5.972 times 10 to the 24 all divided by and again remember don't forget the squared uh, so that will be uh, 6.4 Seven seven one times ten to the three, all squared. And if I just plug that into a calculator, and that comes to uh, eight point six nine meters per second squared. So you can see straight away that even though I'm at a relatively high orbit, that's still going to accelerate at almost the same as g. It hasn't really changed very much at all from regular g. So what should happen is my rocket's going to come up here and then crash back down to Earth. So this is the first misconception that we often see uh, when people first start doing things to do with space, is they think that once you get into space and outside of Earth's atmosphere, um, then you can just be free of Earth's gravity. But we know because of Newton's uh, law of gravitation, it doesn't matter where I am. In fact, anywhere where, there, where I'm a certain distance, or even up to infinity, I'm still going to have a force. Um, that's why in the previous video we said that we measure gravitational potential energy from infinity, because that's the only p location where there is no effect of gravity. I have to make this R over here infinite before um, the, the force goes to zero. So why doesn't my rocket fall straight back to Earth? So how is it that I can stay in orbit? Well, uh, a very wise man, Douglas Adams, once said that there is an art or a knack to flying. 
And in order to be able to fly, all you need to do is throw yourself at the ground and forget to hit it. Uh, now, obviously, he was a comedy writer, uh, one of the best of all time, but he was joking. But it turns out that actually uh, orbits work in almost the same way. Uh, and also, you'll see this if you ever play the game Kerbal Space Program. If you just launch a rocket straight up, it'll go up into space, but then it'll fall back down. So what do you have to do? Well, what you have to do is launch your rocket and then turn. And you have to rotate your rocket to 90 degrees so that it's traveling per uh, sorry, parallel to the horizon or parallel to the surface of the Earth. And then make it start moving forwards. So you have to give it thrust uh, perpendicular to the radius that it's travelling at. Now what will happen then? Well, just think about it logically. If my rocket is now here, and it's experiencing the force due to gravity. Now we worked out earlier that that force due to gravity is going to make it fall towards Earth. But what we've done, by giving it a force perpendicular to its radius, so parallel to the surface of the Earth, it's now travelling along to the side. So what happens is it's going to fall in a parabola, just like a projectile motion. But unlike projectile motion when you deal with it on Earth, so normally when we think about projectile motion we think of it there and we think of it following that curved path, well the Earth is curving down as well. And because the Earth curves as well, there's a perfect speed. If I can get the perfect horizontal speed, if I call that velocity horizontal, then what will happen is that every time my rocket falls one meter down, the Earth will have curved away one meter. So every time I move forward a bit, the Earth curves away. And what that means is I'm constantly falling towards the Earth, but I'm never actually getting any closer to the surface of the Earth. Now, if we think back to when we talked about uh, work done and we thought about gravitational potential energy, we know that gravitational potential energy depends purely on my distance from the center of mass of the object. Now, in a, when I'm in orbit and I'm traveling around my uh, I'm traveling around my object, let's just draw an object over here. So here's my planet, here's my rocket. When I'm in orbit, I travel like this. So I have a constant orbital radius. If my orbital radius is staying the same, then that means that I'm actually not requiring any work to be done. So there's a, there's a really cool thing about orbits is that I'm constantly falling towards the Earth and I'm falling with an acceleration equal to gravity, but I'm not actually getting any closer to the Earth and because I'm not doing any work against a gravitational field and the gravitational field is doing no work on me, I don't actually change my energy. And because I'm not changing my energy, that means my kinetic energy doesn't change, and I don't change speed. How does that work? So how can I be accelerating without changing speed? Well, think back to everything you know. Speed, speed is a scalar. Velocity is a vector. And, if I, and I can accelerate and change my velocity without changing my speed. Because for a rocket going in orbit, it's constantly changing direction. One minute its direction is this way, then later its direction is this way. And because of that, I can still say I'm accelerating. It's absolutely true and correct to say I'm accelerating, but my speed isn't changing and no work is being done on me. So it, I get it for free. I get a direction change without having to expend any energy at all, which is pretty cool. Now, there's a key link to this topic, and that is from circular motion. You know from... Uh, GCSE, well, you might remember anyway, um, that the force required to make something travel with circular motion is equal to the object's mass times its velocity squared divided by its radius. Now you might say, hang on, velocity squared, I thought you just said that velocity is constantly changing. Remember, V squared, that makes it a scalar. If I square something, um, then I lose the directional component of it, which is quite cool. Um, so this is the key bit of information that we need, um, but there's something else we can say. 
the force required, remember that that's important. If I put a force on my object that is not equal to this side of the equation, then I won't travel in circular motion. If I provide too little force, then what happens is, is here's my object, and it will spiral outwards and increase its r until the equation is satisfied. If I provide too much force, then my object will spiral inwards until r meets uh, its requirement. And this m here is the mass of the object. Um, so what can we do with these equations? Well, thinking about these equations, I know that the force due to gravity is equal to big G times the mass of my planet, so I'm going to call this mass Earth now, multiplied by the mass of my satellite, divided by the distance between them squared. Um, what can I do with that? Well, I also know that, whoops, excuse me, that F is mv squared r, and this force comes from gravity. So what can I do? I can say, therefore, that mv squared over r is equal to g mass of the Earth times mass of my satellite divided by r squared. Now let's do a bit more rearranging. Um, I can multiply both sides by r and get rid of one of them. And this m here, this little m, the m from this side is the mass of my object that's doing the, mo the motion, doing the circular motion, so that's the mass of the satellites. So I can divide both sides by that. So I get v squared is equal to g times the mass of my planet divided by the orbital height. And this is a key equation that you're going to want to refer back to. What this tells me is that if I want something to orbit around a planet, I can very quickly find the velocity, sorry, there's not velocity, I can very quickly find the speed that my object needs to have. And if you think, if I have a satellite that's a fixed mass, then the only thing that affects the radius of orbit is the velocity. Okay, so now I want to calculate my orbital time period. That is one of the things you may well be asked to do using the velocity. Um, so what I can say uh, is that, what can I say? Um, I know that my velocity is equal to the distance, sorry, not velocity, uh, I know that the speed, sorry, speed of my uh, object or velocity squared is equal to its circumference, the distance I travel, divided by time period. Well, what is the distance I travel? The distance I travel is just the circumference of a circle, so that's 2 pi r divided by t. Remember, this would be r is from the center of mass of the object. And so if I substitute into the equation v squared, um, I can say that v, v is 2 pi r, so I can say 2 pi r over t squared is equal to g m over t. Now if I multiply out the brackets here that will give me 4 pi squared r squared over t is equal to gm over t. Sorry, that, should be over, that one should be over t squared. And now let's just get rid of my r's. Um, so, what have I done here? Oh, sorry, it should be GM over R. There we go. That's GM over R. Messy handwriting. See? I keep telling you, have good handwriting. Makes your life easier. Um, so let's get rid of the R. Divide both sides by uh, an R squared. Or what should I do? Should I do it the other way around? Yeah, let's make T the subject. Um, so if I want T squared is equal to, I'm going to multiply both sides by T squared, divide both sides by 4 pi over R squared. Uh, so that should give me G... Take that over there. Uh, sorry, so that will give me uh, 4 pi squared uh, R cubed over G M. In other words, I can say that the time period squared is proportional to R cubed. Um, or I could say that T itself 
is equal to the square root of 4 pi squared r cubed over g m. Um, and that's something you might want to be able to re uh, recreate because it is, there are times when they might ask you in a question to do that. Okay, so that's all we're going to have time for today. Um, we will go through a little bit more of this and some of the implications of it uh, in our next couple of lessons. Uh, but I look forward to seeing you then.